Hey, welcome back YouTube. I was going to do this video earlier, but I was so tired after my weekend. I came home and tried to trade the market and freaking crashed, woke up, still beat. But I did want to put this out. So over the weekend, I had five patients and I should say six, six different patients, I should say. And of the six that I had, five, five of those individuals, four of those individuals were, pre were previously previously vaccinated. And as most of the patients that I've seen lately that do come into the hospital are typically the ones that either have, have been vaccinated. Um, I've, I've, had, I've taken care of two patients who were uh, like rule out stroke post-vaccinations, two different ladies that I took care of that had previously had the vaccine and in the, within the same day and ended up in the hospital for rule out stroke. Of the four that I took care of that were um, COVID positive, three of them were symptomatic, right? But of course, most of these individuals do have uh, typical the typical signs of obesity to some extent. One of them was morbidly obese. And then usually CHF or heart failure, diabetes is typically lingered in there somewhere. Now, the patients that I've seen now that have, that do come in, you know, that at least test positive are very different than the ones that I took care of during the first wave. So most of those patients that came in, like in the, I mean, in the very, very, very beginning were like what we, what nurses refer to as walkie talkie, which are like ambulatory self-care individuals. And most of those just tested positive, but had no symptoms. And so at that part, you know, the, the hospital made room They basically were like, pushing out most of the patients that basically didn't have to be in the hospital and for the most part because i worked on a step on a step down in the previous hospital where i was at they basically made room for just you know patients who were COVID 19. and so the very at the very very beginning you know i guess because they didn't know what to expect they were basically having a bunch of these patients that didn't require hospitalization uh, come to the hospital and then eventually we got the more symptomatic patients now these patients you know presented very differently many of these patients died like that they were patients who were literally coming up from the emergency room and many of these patients some of these patients came up dead literally as they were waiting to come to the floor because there were so many patients that were in the emergency room typically the emergency because i worked at a smaller hospital it was like a 400 bed unit and so most of these patients who came in Typically, the ED might hold, you know, 30. If it's really packed, there might be, you know, in the area of, let's say, 40 patients, right? Uh, maybe 45. During those days, the ED was basically packed for the most part between like 70 and 100 patients. So it was like double the load, less nurses available because a lot of people just didn't show up to work. And of course, when, you know, when you have a higher patient to nurse ratio, you know, the quality of care that you're able to give uh, obviously suffers because you're not able to give each patient enough time, especially because all of the patients are basically on the essence of more critical than usually, you know, you have like some stem, some stem, my, you know, some, uh, some semi stable, uh, st stable patients, some that are a little borderline. Maybe you might have some patients that are like, you know, maybe becoming septic. You might have some agitated patients. You might have some Jerry patients, but overwhelmingly, most of these patients were typically on the unstable Basically, if you turned your back for too long on many of these patients, you know, they would you end up calling a rapid response and having that patient, you know, either, you know, with some sort of medical intervention, possibly being intubated. And most of these patients were intubated, on, you know, rather early. And of course, the science show that overwhelmingly most of these patients ended up dying um, by intubating them very early. I think it was about 90% of all patients. And I've shown this in previous videos. Basically, that was around the gist of what it was at the hospital where I worked at previously. It was roughly about 90% of those who were intubated uh, basically were just waiting to die in essence. Uh, most of that, that's why the deaths lagged is because we're, you know, you're putting tubes in these patients, you're putting the patients on a vent and the vent is keeping them alive. They're doing, you know, dialysis for the patient, you know, they're feeding the patient internally, et cetera. So that's why deaths ended up becoming a laggard is because of all of these, you know, life uh, prolonging, uh, saving measure that, that, that they do. Uh, and so that's why, it that's why it takes a little bit longer for deaths to show up, especially because in America, you know, you know, the families and everybody are not coming out of pocket for a lot of these things. And so there's like, well, shit, if it's the taxpayer that's paying for it, like do whatever you want, right? Like do, do everything possible, right? And so that's why there were shortages is because literally 
literally in America, you will have, you know, some of these patients that are like 80, you know, 75, 80, maybe even 90 years old, and they would be intubating these patients. And, you know, the life expectancy in America, for especially for between men and women, it's around, you know, 76, 77, 78 years old. So many of these individuals who are way past life expectancy were, of course, dying because they were already frail coming into the system to begin with. But of course, they don't tell you much of this information. So, and those patients presented very quickly, right? Which is why in the very beginning, if you remember where they were not telling us to document, right? There was no documentation that was required, zero documentation that was required, even for like, you know, simple admissions. It was very minimal documentation, even if the patient was on the ICU floor, there was very minimal documentation that was going on. And so, of course, you know, the, the old saying is if you didn't document it, you didn't do it, right? In terms of nursing practice or medical practice, that was always that was always the thing. Like, it didn't matter if you did do it. It's like, great, you did do it. But in terms of documentation, if you didn't document it, then for all intents and purposes, you know, from a legal perspective, you didn't do it. And so that kind of goes both ways. If, the, if a mistake was making that would normally be documented, well, if it wasn't documented, then you didn't do it. And it's the same way if a healthy intervention or if everything where that was supposed to be done was done and you didn't document it, well, then from that perspective, did you really do everything that was necessary, right? So you can see how the importance of documentation and why in the very beginning, documentation was not done. And of course, I could understand because for many of these patients, you had to watch them so carefully that as soon as the person took off their oxygen, because some patients would present hypoxic where their oxygen levels were very low and of course that impacts the brain where the person then becomes delirious confused they were in a new setting they might be a little bit older where they're in unfamiliar settings and on top of that they have a virus they might be febrile the patient might not be getting enough oxygen to the brain and so all of that uh, works to change the patient's mental status and so you have behavioral changes and so for the most part most of our attention was typically at the bedside Many of these patients literally at times having to put mittens or restraining people uh, because they would become confused and take off their oxygen. And then, of course, their oxygen would deset. You walk in, you'd find your patient naked in the bed, confused, and you would literally be fighting the patient to keep the oxygen on. And that was the etiology of the patients that came into the to the uh, to the hospital setting at the very beginning. These people dropped like that within just a few days. Literally, if they had not intubated these patients, I would say most patients probably probably would have died within the span of less than a week. Now, the etiology of the patients who came in afterwards, what was classified as the second wave, was markedly different. Most of those patients were either asymptomatic or came in for other reasons, which is why I've shown numerous times that it's so important to understand what's the chief complaint. When we admit a patient, we want to know what's the chief complaint. Some people might make a complaint but then once the doctor gains all the information from the patient then the doctor could say okay i understand what you what you were complaining about but this is actually your diagnosis so someone might complain of shortness of breath but then they might come in for chf exacerbation so it doesn't have really anything necessarily to do with the patient's lungs per se it's that the heart is not pumping incorrectly and so what happens is you end up with what's referred to as pulmonary edema and these patients start you know the fluid starts to back up the heart is just basically a pump and so as that pump starts to get weaker you start to not push the blood towards the other hand uh, towards the other end of the body and so it backs up into the lung you end up with fluid in the lung and so that obviously that fluid presents we know with uh you know crackles in the lungs and the person might have like a frothy sputum uh, they might present with a cough a wet cough but it has nothing to do with their actual lungs it has to do with the heart and so that's why it's important to understand what the chief complaint is right what is it that brings you into the hospital why are you here and then what the doctor writes down in terms of what is the admitting diagnosis now Typical patients who presented with COVID typically presented either with shortness of breath or some sort of a fever. And then, of course, it, it continues with and, and then ending up in pneumonia, what they refer to as COVID pneumonia. And, of course, you get the, the whited out lungs where the patient basically can't breathe. They're basically drowning in their own fluids and they require intubation so that they can hopefully pass through. And if... The lungs are not damaged enough they might be able to come off and be extubated and then weaned off onto a regular floor it's very different from most of the patients that i have taken care of 
post first wave post first wave overwhelmingly all of those patients um as far as the ones that i had taken care of were died to secondary events you know cardiac arrest um and overwhelmingly most of those patients were geriatric patients now i'm seeing those exact same patients and then of course they're presenting again uh to the to the hospitals but now of course the reporting on those patients is very different like i've said before they've lowered the ct threshold for pcr swabs and so of course that lowers the amount of people that they throw out on the screen as cases 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 now the reason i bring this up we're going to talk about a couple of things that i've wanted to talk about one was of course the recent cdc one of the one of the doctors here at the cdc the director here says the science is clear right it says if you got the poke it says you are safe and i would say i'd beg to differ like i said in the very beginning out of the four uh, COVID patients that i had this weekend uh, three of them were symptomatic right now again these patients come for different reasons but overwhelmingly all of these patients are symptomatic short of breath and require oxygen bipap etc uh, and of course they typically take much longer to die than by comparison to the other individuals and so they they appear more like the ones on the second wave on a rare occasion you might get someone that literally um, presents like the first wave of patients but it's been quite some time and you know well over a year since i've had a patient that presents that way that you know you turn your back and the patient just desats some of them do some of them still do one of the ladies that i had um she presented that way she was obese with high blood pressure hypertension etc all that stuff right uh, she was morbidly obese stuck in the bed on bipap and if she took her oxygen off she would desat rather quickly so she was one who presented that way and another hispanic man that i took care of presented that way but he left the hospital ama that was his choice you know, how they want to live um and so of course to say that the vax works and you you you, you know you're not going to have much of a worry it really has not been my experience i've shown that in numerous videos where at the very least if this is what you're saying is that it does work well a lot of the patients who are typically on the sicker side like for example that family that i talked about in new jersey where literally the entire family in new jersey was a mother father and son who all of them had been vaxxed and then within a, a month all of them presented as positive with the father being symptomatic in what looked like more like a icu setting where the patient was on bipap i'll link that video at the top now of course like i've said in previous videos we've seen um, the very flip-flopping of you, know, you have to wear a mask you have to social distance even after you got uh, the jab uh, of course now people are are worried because they're saying that um they're saying that you know you, you release too soon or we still need to wear masks etc and so they say if you if you're not vaxxed it says you are not safe and i haven't gotten i haven't gotten the vax i have no intention of getting it and that's my personal choice i don't wear a mask i have never worn a mask as a nurse um, outside like i guess the only time that i have is if like, i go into a business and the business requires me to wear the mask i wouldn't wear i don't wear the masks um, because i think it's going to save me i would only utilize it uh, if the person had asked me to and that's basically my personal stance from all of the research that i have done in regards to pcrs the virus um the vaccine and you know this is not just i don't take vaccines i've taken I've, I, obviously as a nurse you have to get for the most part most of the vaccines and typically i even take the flu shot even though i would still get the flu anyway but so as not to wear a mask um, at the hospital setting which is why typically why most nurses end up getting the flu shot is because they don't want to wear a mask for the duration of the entire flu season they would rather just be like you know what i'm just going to take the vaccine i don't feel like where i don't feel like uh, having to wear a mask that whole time and so that's typically why many of us have taken the, the flu vaccination and of course the cdc says the head of the cdc facing blowback over the agency's new uh, liberalized mask i love the way they present this has offered a stark reassurance on sunday and this is basically what she's talking about and so you see the kind of the, the advice that they give it's not it's not necessarily based on the science i did watch a video from her and like i have often said the information whenever they talk about studies etc it all is coming from israel and that's why i said in the very beginning in many of the videos that i did where i said pay attention to israel you see in israel they have a much younger population right and israel had almost no deaths right and so it's much easier to talk about israel in a in a place where 
they had no go co let's go israel excuse me go israel covid deaths right and so when you look at the the way it presented here in israel and i've said this numerous times in the videos is that let's go deaths so you can go so, so you can see there weren't that many deaths right so of the you can see right here of the 839,000 cases 832 of them have recovered right with only 6,000 deaths and israel has a population of around it's like the size of manhattan basically it's about eight nine million people um and so it was a very 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 small percentage of the people who had who basically had died from the virus or right, we'll calculator right so of the uh, or you go we'll, we'll go 832 and i think at the time i did this previous video it was around like 700 and something it was like 92 percent of the cases had already been resolved and none of these individuals had died and it was like 0.01 percent of the population that had basically had died i think it was about 5800 at the time i did that video right so of the total cases right 832,000 of them had already 839 Right? And so as you can see, of all the cases that Israel has had, almost nine, literally over 99% of the cases are resolved, right? And this has nothing to do with the vaccine because it was the exact same thing in the video that I did prior to it and they had not yet vaccinated a large uh, amount of the population. And so a lot of the information, of course, when you go, is you go if you look at Israel, Israel has, uh, what is it, medium, medium age, right? Israel has a very young population by comparison, for example, to places like America, right? The average age is 30.5 in Africa. It's like in the twenties. And that typically plays a huge role when it comes into a uh, vaccine efficacy is because the people who you really need uh, the jab to work are on the elderly because the young people are not susceptible. Uh, I should say the young people from the statistics coming out of the CDC are not anywhere near as susceptible as those who are geriatric, which is typically why those who are on the older spectrum, you know, I'd say like older than 65 will have a much, much larger, a much, 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 much more likely, excuse me, uh, to come to the hospital, especially if they have comorbidities like diabetes, any sort of obesity, hypertension, et cetera, anything like that, which is your average elderly American patient, right? Because 70% of the population is overweight with 30% of the population being obese. And so that end, end of the spectrum is not going to fare well in terms of uh, in terms of outcome, right? But in Israel, they have a much younger population. They don't have the obesity that America has. And so to use um, studies coming from there and then to extrapolate that data and say well you know that data is going to be applicable to the american people it's just not so because they don't have the obesity it's like the same thing in africa africa has barely any covid cases out of like the 1.3 billion population that they had they had maybe 60,000 uh, they had maybe 60,000 cases um, and so it's you had maybe 60,000 deaths and they were not even sure because they don't have the best a detecting system but they just said let's just take all of the excess deaths um as a best case as a worst case scenario right so worst case scenario in places like in africa and i've done videos talking about that uh i've done i think three different videos talking about africa and the difference between northern africa where you have a, a younger population by comparison to south africa which south africa the median age is a little bit older and that's why south africa is where most of the cases and where most of the deaths in Africa were, while well, in all the other places in Africa uh, were very different, right? And so that's why, you know, like information like this, it really does the American people no good because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take into account the most important thing, which is age and, of course, comorbidities, which is why Italy in the very beginning had such a hard time because Italy has a much older population. UK has a much older population. And so these are the people who are going to present more likely with the virus. And so... You, in my opinion, come fall, you're going to see all these patients right back into the hospital. If things aren't going the way that the government wants them to, CT, C, um, the, the cycle thresholds are going to go up. And it just kind of leads you to the conclusion of what's basically going on within the country. There's a lot of manipulation that is going on within the country, which is why you're seeing stuff like this. And I talked about this last time. Um, where the government this came out to this is today yes yeah, came out today where it says household households including most u.s children to get monthly stimulus pay, uh, payment 
And this is what happens. This is what you see in a collapsing economy. And I've talked about this, about basically America in essence is collapsing, but the collapse is artificial, right? So we've seen with the pipeline being shut down, the hack, right? And just a few days later, um, the hack was resolved. The, the ransom was paid. And then there was news that the hackers had lost control of their computer system and that they were like, just going to retire. And it's like, what? And this is basically what they feed you people because they imagine that most of you are idiots and most people buy into this stuff and they believe it. And it's obvious what is going on is that they are intentionally collapsing the economy, which is why I talked about last time about the mission, uh, the governor in Michigan, what was it Whit Whitmer? Um, that she was forcing the pipeline that runs from uh, Michigan and basically runs all the way up through Canada, which is provided by companies like, for example, Enbridge. Enbridge is a Canadian trade on the New York Stock Exchange, right? And that they're the ones who uh, maintain the pipeline. Enbridge is the company that maintains that pipeline, and it has never leaked. There are like 1,500 American jobs um, of workers who work on that pipeline, and they said that this is stupid. To, there's no leak. They're like, there is absolutely no leak. And so she threatened them and said, if you don't shut down the pipeline, we're going to take all of your money, right? Uh, and so there was no proof of this happening. Uh, it was just her stating that if you don't do this, that there's going to be legal and financial ramifications. And so what you're watching is you're watching deliberate, uh, in essence, bottlenecking. And I talked about this last time with the labor, right? So the government is intentionally bottlenecking the labor. They're they're literally having a lot of people staying at home and they're paying these individuals to stay at home. And then now you can see even further, um, basically those who have children, right? And so from a man's standpoint, this may incentivize more single motherhood because as many of these women have lost their job, many of them may turn to, in essence, the government and baby making to, as a way to scam uh, money from the system so that they can survive. It would not surprise me. I believe it was like, 300 per kit and i'm sure they will ratchet it up there's been different um talks of maybe even excuse me of maybe even 2500 a month for single mothers but i think that was relegated to minorities and so this is the kind of stuff that you uh this is the kind of stuff that you're gonna that you're gonna start to see the other thing that was that i wanted to talk about was again posted by tim pool talked about eric clapton eric clapton had taken the vaccine and he had said the only reason that he took it was because of propaganda and the disastrous experience um, as a result. He says the Hall of Famer who also appeared on Van Morrison's uh, single in December has expressed opinions to anti-lockdown activists, right? And he had talked about here, he says, I took the first jab of AstraZeneca and straight away had severe reactions, which lasted 10 days. I recovered eventually and was told that it would be 12 weeks before the second one. This is about six weeks later, I was offered and took the second dose of the AstraZeneca shot, but with a little more knowledge of the dangers, needless to say the reactions were disastrous. My hands and feet were either frozen or numb and burning and pretty much useless for two weeks. I feared um, that I would never play again. It says I suffer from uh, peripheral neuropathy and should never have gone and I excuse me, and should never have gone near the needle, but the propaganda said that the vax was safe for everybody, right? So unfortunately, many of these individuals are having to learn the hard way of foolishly, of course, the propaganda is very strong, that you're going to die, you're going to turn the corner, you're going to find someone with the virus, they're going to cough, and then you're going to, you know, test positive the next day and end up on a vent somewhere. Now, I always say, of course, uh, follow the money, right? And so it's, I, it's so, it's like no one even talks about this anymore, Cuomo, you know, there's information that has come out that he hid the amount of numbers of patients who had died in nursing homes it was like what is it seven eight nine allegations of some sort of sexual sexual harassment and of course like i always say follow the money right 5.1 million for his book on leadership right and so at the end of the day this is typically what you're going to see you're going to see i talked about bill gates bill gates making you know 200 billion off of the vaccine and of course many americans are ignorant about what's going on you're seeing a deliberate a deliberate collapse of the United States. And this is what happens with uh, worker shortage. Because of worker shortages, you have places like, for example, Wawa's or McDonald's or other small restaurants that are basically trying to do everything that they can to hire people. And so what's happening is the, the, the cost of labor, 
is going to go up. As you can see, Wawa's offering a $500 new sign-on bonus. I think McDonald's was offering like $300 for a sign-on bonus and $50 if you came in for um, if you came in for a, a interview. And and, and all that's going to do is going to drive up the cost of drive up the cost of labor, which is going to cause inflation. I said this in my last video. That's basically why, in essence, you know, the pipeline got shut down. Everybody ran out there and they're like, I got to get my gas. I got to get my gas. And what, what, did, what happened? Gas prices went up. The fear of gas shortages went up. And it's all it's all manipulation. All, all this is basically a manipulating of the economy, the manipulating of people of pay of people's behaviors to cause inflation. And this is what we're seeing here when you have less people who are producing, right? This is what you see in a socialistic economy and how an economy and individuals like this starve in the rise of communism. And this is what is happening here in America, where we're seeing, uh, like I said, because of, you know, the incentivization via, monet via monetary incentives, right, for people to get the vax, because maybe the government will say you can be at 50% or 70% or 80%, but if everybody took the jab, well, then you can be 100%, you can have, you know, all the people outside, because that's the narrative, is the narrative is that, you know, don't worry about it, you're 100% good to go. And so... What you might see in, in areas like this is the push for this, which is going to drive the cost of everything higher. And like I've said, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to push inflation, right? They're trying to push inflation. They're trying to push for UBI. Eventually, we'll get there. We may get there a lot faster uh, than I think. And of course, with the summer coming, you should expect more gas shortages, more prices. There might be an attack on the grid. You know things of that nature because a lot of these things you know they're just it's like you know you when you're directing the herd right when you're direct this is basically what it is everybody's getting herded in a particular direction this is why i said that they've offered so much in relation to getting the jab from free beer marijuana uh, raffling off a of tesla offering people money um you know raffling off the lotto for people in ohio scholarships right because that's the goal the goal is to herd people in a particular direction towards the end goal and the end goal is basically the collapse of uh, a collapse of the economy not necessarily the necessarily the collapse of the government but a collapse of the economy and a complete takeover you're literally watching a coup take place in america from the constitution to something completely different um and this is the last thing i think i think i wanted to talk about whereas in multiple videos, I had contrasted what America is looking like and the direction that America is looking like in comparison to what Nazi Germany was like. And so, you know, Nazi Germany in the 40s and in the late 30s looked very different in the early 20s and 30s. And it, what revolved typically around it was poverty because of sanctions and poverty. Um, basically, the people didn't have anything. You know, they inflated the currency in, in Germany. Um, which led to hyperinflation, which is basically the route that America is going intentionally. It's not that individual, it's not that this is happening as a result of mistakes. This is an intentional directing of the government, the country, and the people. And so I talked often about Hitler and how was it that Hitler was able to get the, the Germans to hate the Jews. And in the very beginning, what he focused on was stating that the Jews were unclean, the Jews were dirty, they spread disease. And so that drove a wedge between those obviously who were not Jews and those who were uh, uh, Germans. And that's basically what it was all about. You know, they interdicted race and we are the superior race, which is why you see things about um, white supremacy and white supremacy uh, is the same thing as terrorism, etc. Right. So they vilify white people. They vilify white culture. They try to magnify, you know, minority culture, primarily black, uh, black Americans, um, that they're, you know, slaves, etc., um, and that white people are basically, the, in essence, the same thing as, uh, as terrorists, right? Their whole way of living, from, you know, having two parents in a household to showing up to work on time, you know, getting a college degree is basically considered white supremacy. Now, it's there was a CNN contributor. Um, who was basically like a freelancer for CNN had tweeted the world today needs a Hitler, right? And so what he's referring to, you know, they talked about it in the sense of anti-Semitism. This had nothing to do with the, this had nothing to do with the Jews. 
It was in relation to those who were not vaxxed, those those the against the anti vaxxers. And so you see, in this sort of an in this sort of an environment is where that whole mindset stems from, right? In this scenario, in this in the way that the country is going, you get the wrong person that comes into power, and you could end up with another Hitler, especially with all these individuals here. I and mean, when you read the comments in here and all it is is fear. All it is is fear. All these people that are like, oh I don't you know I got the vax but I still don't want to take my mask off and what you you know this is too early, etc. And that's like no one is telling you to take your mask off. If you believe that masks work because that's what they tell you, if you believe that it works then go ahead and keep on wearing the mask. You got the vax and you're wearing a mask you shouldn't worry be worrying about what other people are doing. But these people are so afraid and overwhelmingly when you look in the chat it's typically women probably most of these are single women or single moms and this is typically what happens is you just instill fear within the country especially in a country where most of the women are either single moms i think in america it's like 50 percent of all children are born to single mothers in the terms of the country as a whole it's almost 25 percent of the country or the women are single mothers and so most of these individuals are fearful and dependent because they're in situations that are terrible. And so they require the government to, in essence, be their savior. And so that's why when you look through, that's why when you look through these different comments and all these different sections, and why is it that you see, you know, this sort of a complex of going on of someone come save me? It's because there's typically no man in the home. And of course, which is why we've seen, in essence, the demonizing of masculinity within the country. It's, a, it's because exactly at these times, as they say, when the barbarian is at the gate, is when you need masculine men to basically fight for the country. And that's why you're seeing what you're seeing is because uh, overwhelmingly masculinity has been demonized. And so the, what the eventual outcome will be, will be the collapsing of the American government. For single men, it is a good opportunity to think about whether you intend to stay because the outcome of what's going to happen is going to be disastrous, especially in places in here, like in New York, uh, where most of the single, you know, most of the single mothers are typically in what the slums of the city, like in here in New York. And it will just end up divulging into places of sheer violence, especially once the food shortages come, which I've talked about numerously, that there will be food shortages, whether it's most of it looks manufactured, excuse me, most of it looks manufactured between stimulus of keeping people to stay home and giving them unemployment and then fear of the vax and of course making it harder for employers like for example Tyson um, and many of these other food providers like Kraft um, to basically to uh, basically make it harder for farmers and all these different companies uh, to put food on the table and so that's what leads that's what leads to rising prices because these individuals still have money that they're being given from the government and so everybody's got money right there's excess liquidity in terms of being able there's excess purchasing power and so the only thing that happens is when you have excess purchasing power you still have the same amount of demand but now the ability to supply the demand is not there the only thing that happens is prices rise eventually what happens is the government puts in price controls and price controls lead to starvation it happens every time uh, it's basically basically what we're fought, what we're watching is textbook socialism um, on its way to communism here in america what people will choose to do about it i mean in my opinion the only thing that would really stop this is a civil war you would need a civil war you would literally need the men of the nation to rise and overthrow the government I have I don't think that is going I don't see that happening especially because every day that I take the train here in New York all I see is a bunch of effeminate men. Uh, I see, you know, men in dresses or whatever it is, you know, their style of clothing, you can just look at them and you can tell their lifestyle at least here, right? It's obviously a more liberal state. Um but the eventual the eventuality of everything is that what will happen is that the country in essence will collapse and will, will resemble more of the countries of old. It will be the Cubas, the Venezuelas, etc. It will become much more dangerous living here in America. And if you're a single man and you have a skill, you may want to consider getting out. It is my goal. Hopefully sooner, hopefully sooner than later. Otherwise, I'll be like those uh, Hispanics crossing the Rio, except I'll be going in the other direction. Anyway, I'm going to leave it here. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.